Okay. So, so to conclude our presentation is um, Fred Baker again. And, and so Fred is going to summarize a lot of things for us. Um, we've asked him to do a new thing, uh, which, is, um, which is the principles. I think we talked, we talked about that a bit um, in my presentation. Is, is the tussle between two different points of view about two different outlooks on a fundamental idea of how to design a protocol or, or what it is. And so Fred is going to go through and tell you is what are these fundamental principles of, of you know, of the ITF and the internet. So, so this is, as I say, this, I'm, I'm very uh, eager and excited to conclude with this. Thank you, Fred. Sure. Um, and I wish I could say that I was going to cover every principle that supports this protocol design. I'm not. I'm going to cover a number that, that we documented in the idea. Um, so the origin of this, uh, uh, we have gone through in uh, protocol development in the last what, 50 years or something like that. We've, we've made a lot of mistakes. And uh, we have learned from our mistakes. And people have documented, don't do this, do that. And because it works better. Um, and what we have done is many of those have simply been written down in RFCs, and then there's been discussion of them. They're often in passing. Uh, there is one particular RFC that talks specifically about a couple of principles, and that's RFC 3439. Uh, but what, what these are, in, in every case, is somebody has crystallized something that they found important in operations or in protocol design and uh, put it in a few words uh, with, with the hopes of kind of making the next guy's job a little bit easier or uh, for it to work a little bit better. Uh, so this is what I'm going to walk through. Uh, these and uh, you asked about the open standard principles, so which are not protocol principles, but that's another discussion. Um, so, okay, let me talk first about this actually comes up in the discussion of network news. Uh, the guy pulled something out of what he thought was the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, turns out it's actually not. Uh, it's in another writing by Hippocrates, but uh, uh, there's a, a principle that is given to doctors. First, don't break it. You know, it do no harm. Uh, which actually turns out to be really hard. Uh, hard in the human body, hard in protocol design, hard in just about any area that you might apply the principle to. But um, it, it's, it's, if anything, a, uh, a, an appeal to humility. You might not be able to solve the world's problems. And uh, as it's brought out in the discussion of network news, um, and I'm quoting actually from the RFC here, it's vital to understand that you might break things. And if you're not careful, you will. So please don't. Um, decisions that might be suboptimal small context can really blow up in a big context. Um, we had a, a wonderful example of that really in the development of what we now call an Ethernet switch, what in the 1980s when I was working on it was called a, uh, a bridge. Um, the idea was that you could connect two Ethernets or three ethernets or something like that. You could build a network that would go through an area and build something that would act as if it was a repeater. But uh, instead of just passing electrical signals through, capture a message and then send it on. 
people then, uh, the entire Puget Sound area for Boeing was an Ethernet, uh, an extended Ethernet. The entirety of Hughes aircraft from Arizona and California was one Ethernet. The entirety of Texas Instruments in northern Texas was one Ethernet at one time. And they learned that that might not be the greatest uh, network design. Uh, there, there were issues with that. Uh, and, and the thing was that things that would happen on a local area network, on, 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 on an Ethernet, that were okay if they were contained to a yellow cable became really big problems when it became the state of Texas, um, <clears throat> which is a big place. For those of you who don't live in Texas, Texas is huge. Um, okay, so uh, one, one of the things that we learned along the way was exercise some humility. You might break things and don't do that. Um, another principle that is brought out in uh, an IAB document on architectural principles of the internet, RFC 1958, is what, what they describe as, or what Brian described as a principle of constant change. Um, whatever you think the internet is today, tomorrow it will be different in some way, perhaps an important way. The internet, internet constantly changes. And uh, Brian, in writing this, uh, compares operations in the internet to uh, the structure of the city, which is constantly being changed. Street, streets move around, they change names, buildings fall down, buildings get built. Uh, there, there's constant change in a city. And he says, you know, the internet is kind of like that. We keep playing with different parts of it, and they change. Uh, now, Mike O'Dell, is a an operator. He was the chief scientist of UUNet in the mid 1990s, uh, and he's known for his pithy comments about operating things. And uh, he compared what we were working on at the time, which was the deployment of IPv6 and the, the development of IPv6. He compared. Uh, changing the internet from IPv4 to IPv6 as changing the engines of an airplane in flight. Uh, if you don't do it right, the airplane might crash. Um, and oh, by the way, it's really easy to not do it right. Um, <clears throat> well, we constantly are changing the application flows of the internet. We're constantly changing protocols in the internet. We, we change the applications that are predominant perhaps every three to five years. Um, the fact is that we do transitions pretty regularly, uh, and they do eventually happen. But there is usually a long period of coexistence between two technologies. Um, you know, it, when, when we first published the IPv6 specification, I had journalists come to me and say, okay, so when is the internet going to make the transition? And I said, well, I'll give it some time and take some work. They came back to me a year later and said, is it done yet? I said, no, it's not done yet. Uh, we, we're still in the process of a transition, and we will eventually get there, but uh, it's, not, it's not something that happened suddenly, and frankly, if it did happen suddenly, you wouldn't want that. That would, things would be catastrophic in the course of that. Um, but okay, so in protocol design, presume, principle of constant change says presume that things will need to coexist. Uh, so now an example of that is the growth of IPv6. Uh, uh, we, we first published RFC 1883 in 1995. Paul brought that up earlier today. Uh, and we did some trial deployments. We learned some things about it, tweaked some things, uh, and published RFC 2460. Uh, IPv6 did 
didn't see any significant deployment until about 2007 when the, the ICANN community built a principle or a, um, a policy for the deployment of addresses. And you know, when people could get addresses, then, then they started playing with it. But the market didn't require it until 2011 when APNIC ran out of IPv4 space and that became pressure. Um, and now if I look at this slide, I, I don't see significant traffic in any network until 2014. Reason probably has to do with the IPv4 addressing market. You know, people were doing whatever it took to not have to deploy IPv6. And um, you know, since then, we've seen a significant growth in traffic. You know, it, it's actually that. Um, so that top line is Belgium. Belgium is somewhere on the order of 50 or 60 percent of the traffic is IPv6. But, um, but uh, okay, so, so you're looking at an example of the fact that things changing over a period of time and you know, coexistence, Melini. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll, we can talk more later too, but you know, this is measured on the big eye internet, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So. Well, it's measured in various places. The, the picture actually comes from Google, and Google is largely a CDN. So it's going from people's homes and from the enterprise to a, a data point that is literally right in front of them. Okay, but I guess the point I wanted to make is that it's not measuring um, private networks that enterprises have and private connections that enterprises do. Well, to you the realize that you didn't say that it did measure that. No, no, no. I just wanted to make that. I just wanted to make. No, I know you're not. I know you're not. But I wanted to make that point because, yeah, because I wanted to make that okay, point. Okay, so yeah. that's completely by the side of why I put this up. Uh, so this is an example of coexistence, uh, and, and there, there is in fact coexistence between the protocol sets. Okay. Um, oh, here we go. Um, now, along the same lines, if I look at IPv6 use in India, uh, now, now Jail went to APNIC basically five minutes after they ran out of IPv4 space and said, bless us, we need lots of it. And they followed their policies and they, they gave them, I think it was a thousand addresses or something like that. And uh, Geo said, oh no, what am I gonna do? Went out on the address market, bought addresses, made it happen until, what's the date there? It's uh, 20, 2015. And finally they said, economic pressures Life is not good in the uh, B4 address market. Let's try this, what you call it, IPV vault. Uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, very quickly, over 50% of their traffic was uh, using IPv6. And now, now the difference between the blue line and the red line there, uh, the, those are both geo, but uh, the, the blue line is things that are demonstrating that they can use IPv6, and the red line is things that are choosing to use IPv6. And that's uh, a, a, a result of, uh, I mentioned George Michelson's test earlier today, that's George Michelson's uh, experiment. And, okay, so what they find now is that uh, in the neighborhood of 90% of the traffic, on geo is using IPv6. Okay, it just is. Okay. Now the other thing that's interesting in this is the lower two lines of the yellow and the green. Now what they are is three other companies that didn't deploy right away. They were holding on, but when economics forced them to, they they turned around and said, well, let's give it a try. And so now they are saying IPv6 deployment. Um, or IPv6 traffic. Uh, so, so once again, we have coexistence. There's everything that isn't V6 is V4. Um, and uh, you're 
seen the effects of basically economics on those, but uh, but you're seeing the behavior of a uh, a coexistence pattern there between the new and the old. So so uh, the, the principle that that I'm trying to point out here is uh, don't don't just you know don't come back to me and say are we done yet? No, we're not done. It's going to take a while, you know. Um, Um, now, now, Bellini, you mentioned the end-to-end -end principle, uh, and let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, so now, the observation actually is right now being made in law. Uh, if you, oh, what's his name? The guy from Stanford who is uh, comparing law to the end-to-end -end principle and uh, behavior I forget his name. John Wood. Huh? John Wood. Oh, well, he's at Harvard. Um, but, um, okay, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the name. But, okay. So, when we first started deploying networks, uh, people put the network together with the, with the idea that traffic would go from here to there based on where people intended it to go. It could get sent somewhere else, and there were if I look at X25 and some of the things that were going on in that time frame, it was very reasonable for traffic to be sent in other paths and to do different things. And <clears throat> there were problems that, that came out of it. Uh, and so there was discussion in, in the, the wider internet community at the time about so what, what's important here? Uh, should I be stopping traffic? and inserting middleware and so on and so forth. And in Seclat, in uh, the French network, they said, well, let's actually change things so that the network <coughs> is almost irrelevant. All decisions are made in the application. Uh, and now then, about 10 years after that, 1981, uh, Salser's paper came out in which he said, no, this is actually turned out to be very important that uh, if you're doing, if, if you're sending traffic somewhere and doing something to it that the sender doesn't expect, it can be very hard to, uh, to debug. Um, we heard discussion, was it yesterday, about uh, segment routing. One of the issues in segment routing is that uh, the M, M system doesn't put the header into the IPv6 header that has the list of segments. Uh, and so when the thing goes into the network, then the network inserts that header. Well, now the sender is sending a packet that's a certain size. And with the header insertion, the packet got bigger. Now, if it goes along to some place where uh, it needs to be fragmented. What happens is that a message comes back to the original sender that says, please don't send packets bigger than this because <clears throat> life's terrible. And what does the sender say? I didn't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so the end to end principle would say then that the network changed the packet. And as a result, the originator can't debug what's happening. It doesn't understand what's happening. So this is the, the targeted behavior of the end to end principles. Let's make sure that the sender can do what, what you want him to do in order to achieve the result of communication with the endpoint. Um, a service layer, in essence, should, should do what its client wants it to do. Uh, if the if you're going and changing things and making it opaque to the sender, you're going to have problems in your network and it will be terrible. Um, now you were talking about enterprise problems and the fact that people want to go looking at stuff in the network. That's great, it's called a proxy. Now, uh, think about how you do what it is that you want to do in that. I've got a packet going through the network and it's going now 
you know, out of the network or across some boundary, and um, you want to, at that boundary, do some kind of an inspection. And now uh, think how, how I might defeat that if I wanted to defeat them. Uh, in uh, the Linden Internet Exchange, there's a, a lawful intercept technology where we do deep packet inspection. We um, send all the packets that are going to a pornography site or something like that. We send it through a, uh, a thing in the middle, which now looks at it and says, oh, that's an HTTP GET message for some file that, that we don't want to allow in our network. And we'll just drop that message. You know, and the guy doesn't get to view that, that stuff. OK, so how do I get around that? Uh, if, I've, if I'm on a system that thinks I might be subject to that, what I might do is take the, the character string, get whatever the URL is, break it up into individual bytes, and send each of the individual bytes in a separate TCP message so that at the endpoint, when it arrives, it'll all get put back together, and I now have the command and the thing comes, comes back. But with the guy in the middle, I'm only looking at a byte at a time, and I don't have the capability of doing that. If I'm doing it literally as I described, where it's going through the network and I'm applying some kind of intercept technology there. But suppose, just for fun, that what I had was something that finished out the, the transport layer and looked at, looked at it you know, in place. We've now assembled all the segments together and I can read it. I, I can say, you know, this was a message saying, you know, get whatever that URL is, and I can, I can look at the URL. Okay, now what I just described was the implementation of a proxy. Um, if I'm doing some kind of a linear interpolation, I have a very great complexity in the network, and it can be defeated. But if I build a proxy, then it comes up and I can look at it now at the application layer or at the appropriate layer for the technology. Okay, so if, if I was to accomplish what you said you wanted to accomplish was the, the ability to look at traffic, and I do it in a, in a proxy, I can do it in a way that's architecturally correct and works. Yeah, we, should, we, we need to do this over drinks. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. or if, if I had a whiteboard here, I'd draw pictures yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but, I mean, we can do proxies and still meet the end-to-end -end principle because the two endpoints, one of the endpoints is now the proxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. now um, there's a wider discussion there. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. so, so that's the point here, yeah. is yeah. to yeah. make the network behave predictably and enable the sender now to debug when something goes wrong. Okay. Now, another principle, and this comes from RFC 3439, um, relates to complexity versus simplicity. Basically, something that is simple can be understood, and we can actually debug it. If it's complex, we might spend a long time trying to figure it out. Uh, when we have protocols, that are really crazy and have a lot of complexity built into them. No, oh, by the way, we have a few protocols like that. Uh, Mike O'Dell's comment was, if you're not afraid, you don't understand. Uh, trying to debug that network, trying to debug that application becomes very, very difficult. Uh, and in the course of preparing this, I ran across a, uh, a paper uh, uh, about how complex systems fail. And you know, I'm not going to go through the whole paper here, but you, know, you might find that interesting reading just to take a look at the ways that they fail. Um, <clears throat> the amplification principle, this comes from the same RFC, RFC 3439. Uh, and the typical engineering example that people give 
is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State in, in the United States. And this is a bridge that was built to carry traffic across a fairly wide river. Um, and when did this happen? I want to say 1940, 1942 or something like that. Uh, there was a windy day and the wind happened to hit the bridge just right that there, there was a resonant frequency problem in the structure of the bridge. The bridge started flopping around and finally just fell apart. Uh, and so now if you're in engineering textbooks and looking at engineering architecture, uh, you'll read about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge and don't do that. Um, now, the interesting thing is that we have the same behavior in networks. Um, we have the same behavior in networks. If we have uh, a test that I, that I used to do on OSPF systems, I would bring up, uh, just you know, plug in the power and bring up a dozen routers that were talking with each other using OSPF across, uh, across a local area network. And I could now watch uh, different, just the, the uh, the resonance of the routers sending out hellos and figuring out their states and so on and so forth. Uh, and when, when, when bad things happen, they happen in a big way. Uh, and I could watch routers fail. And that turned out to be a very useful test in testing the protocol and in testing my implementation of it. Uh, also from the same RFC. Uh, discussion of coupling. When I have things that hold on to each other, um, then one can jerk the other around, and uh, it, you know it becomes uh, a problem with unforeseen feature interactions. Um, <coughs> and uh, that we see in routing protocols actually quite a bit because they will periodically emit a message and say, hi, I'm here. And might not say any more than that, but literally every so often they, they send out a message. And if they happen to be on a resonant frequency with each other, then all of the routers on land will be responding to the same message from all of their neighbors at the same time and do it every few seconds. Uh, so what we do in routing protocols in order to forestall that is that we intentionally randomize the timing between such messages in order to spread them out and have them not coupled together and have it not amplified. Now, was it you mentioned this quote? It's come up several times. Okay, let me tell you the origin of that quote. Uh, the we knew uh, in the early 90s that, uh, that there was a problem and we would need to uh, update the, the protocol from IPv4 to something else. Uh, and we knew that as much as anything because of a, uh, a talk that was given by a statistician by the name of Frank Slensky at the IETF meeting in August of 1990 in Vancouver. And uh, so, you know, various parts of the community are talking about that, trying to figure out what comes next. And the IAB, in its infinite wisdom, said, okay, we're going to have a meeting in Kobe. Let's all sit down and decide that the new protocol is this OSI protocol called CLNS. You know, we'll just switch the entire internet over to running CLNS. And uh, they came back and which was part of the TCP IP versus OSI war, as it turned out. Uh, they came back to the IETF. The IETF basically threw them in the river. Uh, they weren't having it. Uh, and so in, in the IETF meeting in the summer of 1992, this was announced that the decision had been made by the IAB in June at Kobe. Uh, I never came. And in July, they came and told the IETF the IETF wasn't having it. Um, and uh, so Dave Clark gave a talk 
that Wednesday night at the plenary. And one of the slides that he showed was, uh, I'm sorry, you know, IAB, you're wrong. And, uh, you know, we, we don't believe in having great high pubas that tell us what to do. We believe in things that actually work. Uh, we, we believe in rough consensus and running code. That's where the, the quote comes from. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the issue there, the, the reason that the IETF looked at CLNS and said, no, we're not doing that, was that uh, it was signed. And we had governments basically adopting it and telling us, you know, this is where you're going. Um, bad things will happen to you if you don't go where we tell you to. And then they would turn around and we would have all of the discussions and, and you know, all of the development work that was done for that stuff using a TCP IP network. TCP IP worked and the OSI protocols didn't. And uh, the IETF turned around and said, well, at the point where you, you know, tell me that I have to go in a place that doesn't work, I'm sorry, I've got better things to do. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so this particular quote is talking about an ethic in, in the IETF that says, that's my first job, is to build things that work. And in, in building a protocol, in building a network, in building a operational practice, whatever it might be, first requirement is that it work. Um, and then in security, you know, general, generally run across the principle of least privilege, which is that I want to give you all of the capabilities and all of the pri privileges that are necessary for you to do your job, and I don't want to give you anything else. And why do I not want to give you anything else? Because you might abuse it, and you don't need that to do your job. Okay, so the principle of least privilege is something that we have run across in, uh, in security, and will generally build into protocols. Um, so I asked about an open standard. This is actually not protocol design, this is organizational design. Uh, the IETF has operated in a certain way for a long time. The uh, ITU and Etsy and other standards bodies have operated on a very different way. <coughs> and so if, if you go to an IETF meeting, if you go to an ITU meeting, what you're very likely to hear is you know, when somebody says, I don't like that protocol, I don't like this feature, I don't like this interaction, whatever it is that it is. When you go to the de jure standards bodies, they'll find, you know, uh, Madam President, uh, I'd like to make a comment. We, you know, are worried about this particular whatever and, you know, so on and so on. There will be a very long statement. Now, in the IETF, what you're likely to hear is, it doesn't work. Uh, and we tend to be short and to the point. Uh, but as, as much as anything, it's because we're not wasting time. We're going in the direction of things that work. Okay, so I saw talking with the ITF, sat down and designed or described what they call the open stand principles. And kind of as a statement to all the other SDOs, Listen, guys, if it doesn't work, that's, that's no good. Let's operate in a way that enables open discussion and open open standardization. Okay, so uh, we want to have first principle. We want to have respectful um, communications with the other standards bodies. What we found quite often was that the other standards bodies would come stand on our uh, technology and change it in ways that were incompatible with what we did. We had that specifically with MPLS. I hear that there's discussions about that with TLS. Um, and um, you know, we need to not trip over each other. Uh, the 
uh, second principle talks about adherence to fundamental parameters and the need to behave in a way that achieves the result. Uh, and then the third principle talks about collective empowerment to actually develop standards that, that uh, serve the community that they're um, that they work on based on technical merit. Uh, and then you need to be able to read the full things. Uh, don't make me spend a thousand dollars to buy one. Uh, does that happen? Absolutely it happens. So I was on the SGIP, which is uh, uh, protocols for the power units. And we needed to compare um, documents that came out of IET documents that came out of ITU and we wound up having to uh, go to both of those organizations and get the assurance from them that they would let us read the documents without purchasing them because otherwise each person that wanted to review the documents would wind up spending upwards of five thousand dollars just to get the pile of paper in order to to make that comparison uh, and, I just kind of read around the web. Uh, okay, so the fourth principle talks about availability. And then the fifth principle, uh, uh, many of the standards, the CCITT standards for the X25 and so on and so forth, were driven by law. In order to operate in Germany, you must, you know, in Germany, I'm picking a state off, off the top of my head, but you know, it's happened actually quite a bit in Europe. Uh, why do people deploy the internet? Because it works. Uh, and they choose to. They, they don't have to. But, but, but they choose to. Okay, so when we talk about the, the open stand principles, that, that's what we're talking about, uh, those. So, okay, now, I'm standing between you and dinner. Um, so, I, I've moved along. Uh, and. That I'm actually done. <laughs>